let's take a look at fields in practice. So first, let's collect or organize some of the information that we have about forces and fields and potential energy and potential. And I'm going to make one column for electric stuff and another column for gravitational stuff. So here's the equations for the electric force and gravitational force. Okay. Uh, here's the equations for the electric field and the gravitational field. And I'll do a little bit of math so that we see the similarities here. And there's potential energy. Well, the potential energy for an electric situation is given by this equation. And for a gravitational situation, it's given by this equation. And then for potential, we can do a little bit of math and get these expressions. You may notice when looking at these equations, there are many, many similarities here. So why would that be? Why are electric and gravitational forces and fields and potential and potential energy, and why are they so similar? Well, these both are a type of force known as inverse square law forces, which are pretty common in physics. Inverse square law forces are forces where the force is proportional to 1 over r squared, where r is the distance between objects that are experiencing the force, or causing and experiencing the force, really. So, for example, the electric force is given by f is equal to kqq over r squared, and the gravitational force is given by f is equal to gmm over r squared. They both have that r squared in the denominator. Now, Remember, the field at a location is the force per charge or force per mass. Uh, so we can get an expression if we have an isolated point charge. The electric field near or around that isolated point charge is given by this expression. And if we have an isolated point mass, the gravitational field strength near that isolated point mass would be given by this expression. And please note that I said isolated point charge and isolated point mass. That's the only situation where these equations apply. If you have multiple charges and multiple masses, it takes a little bit more effort. So, fun fact. Inverse square law forces, and some other forces, but right now we're concerned with inverse square law forces, they are related to the gradient of the potential energy. And I'm going to write two expressions here, one for electric force and one for gravitational force. Electric force is equal to the negative of the gradient of the electric potential energy. And the gravitational force is equal to the negative of the gradient of the gravitational potential energy. And we can show this, or using this, we can get expressions for electric potential energy and gravitational potential energy. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of the details here. There's a lot of negative signs that are being played with fast and loose, and I'm not going to explain really why this is true or go through the arguments about why this has to be true. But one takeaway that I want you to get from this is that there are some relatively deep and abstract connections between these quantities. And another fun fact is that for inverse square law fields, they are related to the gradient of the potential. So, for example, the electric field is equal to the negative of the gradient of the electric potential. And the gravitational field is equal to the negative of the gradient of the gravitational potential. Uh, now, in this class, we're not going to really deal with gradients or derivatives, not directly. Um, so, we'll express the electric field as being equal to the negative of the change in V over the change in R. And the gravitational field is equal to the neg negative of the change in V over the change in R, where the change in V is the change in the potential between two locations, and delta R is the distance between the two potentials. So there are these pretty deep and, like I said, abstract relationships between force and field and potential energy and potential. Um, and I can try to summarize it here where right, field is equal to the force per charge or per mass. And potential is the potential energy per charge or mass. And then force and potential energy are related because the force is the negative of the gradient of the potential energy. 
And the field is related to the potential because the field is equal to the negative of the gradient of the potential. So there's all these strange and abstract relationships going on between these quantities. Let's start with a uniform field. A uniform field is when the field is the same everywhere. We have a constant value of the field at all places. Um, we see this for electric fields. We see uniform electric fields between plates that carry opposite charges. So like, for example, very large capacitors. Uh, we also see pretty roughly uniform gravitational fields if we consider locations near the surface of the Earth. And if the field is uniform, then the field versus distance graph would look like this. Just a straight line. It's uniform. It's the same everywhere. And so if we figure out V, the potential, well, let's see. Well, the field is equal to the negative of the gradient of the potential. So the potential would have to look like this, right? Because the negative of the gradient would have to give us the field. So then the potential graph would have to look like this. Another special situation that we can consider is the charged sphere. So if we have a positively charged sphere, and let's make it a conducting sphere so that there's no electric field inside of it, and the electric field outside of the positive charge would just look like this, well, the electric field versus R graph would just look like this. Right? The electric field is zero inside of the sphere, and outside of the sphere it just decays as 1 over r squared. If that's true, then the v versus r, the potential versus r graph, would have to look like this. Now, you can convince yourself, because remember, the electric field has to equal the negative of the gradient of the potential. And if you spend enough time working with this V versus R graph, you can convince yourself that if you get the gradient of the graph at any location, then the negative of the gradient of the graph is always going to provide you with the electric field at that location. All right, now let's take a look at escape speed. So escape speed is defined as the speed that's necessary to completely escape the gravitational influence of an object. In other words, it's the speed that you need in order to just barely reach infinity. So let's draw a graph of potential energy versus R. Uh, if you're at some distance right here, uh, the question is, how fast do you have to travel in order to get to R equals infinity? Well, if you're at this initial location, let's call it capital R, then the potential energy that you have at that location is equal to negative gmm over R. At infinity, your potential energy is equal to zero, right? If you're at infinity, look at that graph, if you're at infinity, gravitational potential energy is equal to zero. So, if we assume that no energy is lost or gained in this situation, then the initial, initial energy has to equal the final energy. The initial energy is whatever kinetic energy the object has at the beginning plus the potential energy that the object has at the beginning. And at the end, let's assume that it just reaches infinity. So when it reaches infinity, it doesn't have any extra energy at all. So all it has is its potential energy, which is zero. Okay, so in that situation, if we solve for this, we get V is equal to the square root of 2gm over R. That is an expression for the escape speed. And just to be clear here, g is a gravitational constant. m is the mass of the object which you're trying to escape, which is often a planet or a star or something like that. And then r is the distance from that planet at the beginning, or the distance from the center of that planet, planet at the beginning. Now, let's take a look at orbital speed. Um, back in Unit 6 for circular motion, we found that in a circular orbit, the centripetal force is the gravitational force. Um, we have an expression for the centripetal force, mv squared over r, and we have an expression for the gravitational force, gmm over r squared, and we can do a little bit of math, and we can get an expression for the orbital speed, 
orbital speed is equal to the square root of gm over r, where m is the mass of the object that you're orbiting, and r is the radius of the orbit, which is the same as the distance between the two objects' centers. Well, how can we relate this to energy? Well, the kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared, so in a circular orbit, the kinetic energy is 1 half m times square root of gm over r squared. So the kinetic energy is equal to 1 half gmm over r. Now, the potential energy is equal to the negative gmm over r. So in a circular orbit, we have this weird little relationship. The kinetic energy is equal to negative 1 half of the potential energy. So there's half the amount of kinetic energy as compared to the potential energy, if you just ignore the negative sign. So if we get the total energy of an object in a circular orbit, total energy would just be the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. If we add those two together, we get negative 1 half gmm over r. So the total energy in a circular orbit is negative.